So uh, this is a talk about uh, the design that went into the new NetBSD Entropy subsystem. That is uh, the part of the system that uh, go operates behind the scenes when you try to read from DevU random or similar. Um, and it's uh, it's all basically in this this one diagram. So that's that's the whole thing. Um, all right, are we done? No, I'm kidding. Uh, the um, uh, this is just a, a very rough uh, summary. I'm going to go into the background of uh, what entropy is and how, why it's significant for uh, computing, um, and then some of the uh, finicky practical considerations that went into why this diagram is shaped the way it is, and uh, then. Um, uh, a little bit about the cryptographic choices that I made in uh, the particular primitives that uh, that, I, that, uh, that I used for um, uh, NetBSD's new entropy subsystem. Um, this uh, all of the subject of this talk is not yet in a NetBSD release. Um, it will be in NetBSD 10 uh, when that is released, um, but it is it is currently in under development in NetBSD head. So. Um, the background motivation is that computers need unpredictable secrets. Um, whenever you're, uh, you open a, you know, a browser window to navigate to your bank, uh, you need, um, your computer needs to, needs to be able to generate some unpredictable secrets to, uh, uh, talk to the bank's website in a way that, uh, nobody on the, else on the internet can eavesdrop and, uh, forge messages to the bank to transfer your funds somewhere else or, uh, things like that. Um, uh, so, you know, basic internet protocols uh, like HTTPS and SSH uh, need uh, secrets for various purposes, uh, and operating systems also need ephemeral secrets um, for uh, writing swaps securely, so that someone can't just take your hard disk uh, and uh, later on uh, pull the, uh, say, short-term bank secrets uh, from from the from the uh, from what got swapped out temporarily. Um, so uh, what does unpredictable mean? Um, well, uh, to the parties who are involved in a session like a, a, an HTTPS session uh, between uh, your web browser and the bank's uh, server, um, uh, the, the, the secrets are very predictable because we know what they are. Uh, what's interesting, though, is the perspective of an adversary who is on the path between these two servers and does not know a priori what the uh, what the secret keys are for the cryptography in, in HTTPS, um, but knows something about the system. They know what software you're running. They know uh, what you know what machine you're running on. Probably they they know some software versions. They they, they know some information. They uh, um, but we hope that they don't know a certain uh, secret keys. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of, of how SSH HTTPS work. Just take as a premise that there are some secrets involved in here that parties involved in the protocol know and adversaries. Well, we hope that they do not know and cannot figure out what those keys are. Um, so uh, a lot of this is going to be about uh, in, uh, ensuring that we can um, uh, uh, ensuring that the adversary has a, a limited state of knowledge uh, in, with incomplete information. Um, so in order to quantify uh, unpredictability, we use the language of probability theory. And I'm going to um, breeze through these slides, but you can go back and breeze them at your own at your own pace. Uh, some basic background probability theory. Um, so probability distribution is is a, a quantitative representation of a state of knowledge. Um, it assigns a uh, probability to each of various possible outcomes, like you know heads or tails, uh, for a coin fair fair coin toss. Of course, you could have a biased coin toss where there are different probabilities, but this is yeah, the, the most basic uh, example of Bernoulli trial. Um, you could uh, take uh, a die roll, or perhaps two die rolls, and you can sum the results of the two die rolls to get a, a number from 2 through 12. Uh, and the, each of these outcomes will have some probability associated with it. And this is just a, you know, some examples of probability distributions. So it's a, it's a mapping from possible outcomes to the probability of that outcome. Um, now, when an adversary is, is involved in this, uh, the adversary wins a prize if they can guess what what our secret in HTTPS or SSH is, and you know they can maybe transfer funds out of out of out of your account to another account somewhere in the Cayman Islands. Um, and it's hard to get to the Cayman Islands because it's you know across the ocean and you have to swim really far to get there. Um, uh, so uh, we might. Um, uh, approach this uh, um, setting setting bounds on the probability that the adversary can do something bad. That is, the adversary can win their prize um, by considering what's the probability of success for their their optimal strategy. Now, we're not going to get into game theory here. This is going to be a very simple um, analysis. We just look at the probabilities of um, 
of, uh, of, of outcomes and um, look at the most probable outcome. So for, uh, with a fair coin toss, um, uh, the adversary's probability of guessing what your coin was if they didn't actually watch you flip the coin is one half. Um, no matter what they pick, uh, there's a one half chance that, th that their guess is correct. With a sum of two die rolls, the adversary um, uh, can get a much better chance if they always guess seven. That's their, that's their strategy gives the best probability of success at guessing what the sum of two unknown die rolls is. Um, all the other outcomes have lower probability. Uh, entropy is a um, uh, numeric summary of this probability distribution um, or of a process whose outcomes follow, follow a distribution. Um, and it's a way to, uh, to, to uh, uh, it's, it, there are very different, various different kinds of entropy, but the one of interest uh, in cryptography is min entropy, which uh, is, is in some sense just another, another, another way to write down the adversary's best chance of success. Um, so uh, when you when you consider the experiment of a fair coin toss, uh, or the, the physical process of a fair coin toss, or a state of knowledge that does not contain the outcome of a fair coin toss, just that a coin was tossed, there's one bit of min entropy. Um, you take a, a die roll, there's about two and a half bits of min entropy in, in the, the distribution on possible outcomes. Uh, it, curiously, if you take the min entropy of the sum of two die rolls, it's also two and a half bits because uh, even though there are many different possible outcomes, the most probable outcome still has the same probability as a single die roll. Now, computers are uh, usually very predictable. Um, of course, many of us have experience uh, trying to track down bugs that uh, seem to uh, defy this premise, but lar you know, largely computers are you know, behave very predictably. Um, for the secrets in uh, protocol, we need to make sure the adversary cannot predict them though. So we need to maximize unpredictability in, uh, in some way, which is, which is difficult when you have a machine that operates on bits and always produces the same output bits when given the same input bits. Um, so we need to have some connection to uh, uh, device drivers. Um, uh, that is to devices uh, outside the um, CPU's logic uh, which is doing the computation, doing the you know, reliable deterministic computations. Um, uh, so, uh, for example, we might have a uh, device that has a Geiger Mueller tube, uh, which is pointed in alpha emitter. There's a Geiger counter, and it counts ionizing events. Now, um, these are uh, very unpredictable in the sense that we have a good physical model from nuclear physics of how ionizing events happen, uh, of, of, of not how they ha happen, but of, of, uh, of, of um, uh, patterns in how they happen, which is that uh, the uh, time between two events is distributed by an exponential distribution roughly. Um, and so the number of events within a particular time period is Poisson distributed. And uh, there's some finicky details about um, uh, you know, uh, 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 dead time for the Geiger Miller tube after, after it's registered to count. Um, uh, after a registered event, then it doesn't register another one immediately after that. But yeah, you know, so there's, there's some phys physical engineer, you know, physical, um, yeah, you know, some physics that goes into this. Physics and engineering goes goes into into this into this stuff, and it's it's not just a CPU, um, CPU logic. Or we could have a device driver for a bored human who's you know flipping coins and typing in the outcomes H T H H H T and so on. Um, of course, uh, it's kind of inconvenient to, you know, carry around an alpha emitter in your computer. You generally don't want to do that because it's likely to flip some bits in RAM and then you kind of corrupt data. So in, um, uh, in, in practical computer systems, uh, we, um, uh, the, the, the most common example that, that, that we, that we use, we see is, uh, jitter between independent clocks. Um, so, uh, these days, a lot of computers, a lot of SO systems on chip, um, a lot of CPUs, a lot of modern x86 CPUs um, have uh, some kind of design based on ring oscillators, where you have two circuits on a die clocked independently. One of them just has um, uh, you know a bunch of not gates uh, to have some propagation delay, um, but it, you know it goes back and circles circles back on itself to uh, to keep on flipping bits back and forth. And then another another circuit independently samples what the bit is at some at some point and and as long as the clocks are independent there's going to be some jitter between them there's going to be some thermal noise in the circuit and uh so you can't um unless you you know have some well you, you know ideally you, you basically can't uh without some uh profound knowledge of the quantum physics inside the device um uh predict what the what the bits are going to be 
Um, then we also have uh, interrupt timings. You know, you can have an interrupt handler uh, that samples the CPU cycle counter. And that, that's, it's, it, in, a, in a sense, in a philosophical sense, it's, it's like a ring oscillator. Um, uh, it's structurally a similar idea. But it's very difficult to confidently assess um, the entropy of the, um, uh, uh, of the distribution of uh, samples. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we, 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 you know, um, without, without a, a very, very good understanding of how the device is structured, it's hard to know how much jitter there is. Now there, there's, there's literature out there on designing ring oscillator circuits, um, and, uh, estimating the entropy of the, uh, of the process. But, um, when you have a big complex system, you can sort of hope that it's unpredictable, but it's, it's hard to be confident in that. And, in the worst case, um, you might wind up with uh, hardware peripherals that are actually driven by the same clock as the CPU cycle counter. So there's no entropy whatsoever, even though you might look at the samples and to an untrained eye, it might look like, oh, it looks kind of random, but it turns out uh, under the hood, um, it's actually uh, you know, a determinist number of cycles uh, between between interrupts that it might vary depending on uh, what software is running, but there's there's nothing actually going into it from the physical world outside. And so if you know what software is running, you, you can predict exactly what the timings are going to be. Um, now, another thing about uh, physical systems versus cryptography is that physical systems uh, tend to have very non-uniform distributions. Um, the possible outcomes have different probabilities. So like, as I mentioned with, with Geiger counters, uh, they are Poisson distributed, um, or the, the durations between them are exponentially distributed. Um, uh, so it's, this is, this is uh, you know, from the model of radioactive decay. Um, and so, you know, very small numbers of counts are much more probable than very large numbers of counts for, um, uh, or sorry, very small durations between between counts are, are much more probable than very large durations between between counts. Um, similarly, even with um, uh, ring oscillators, which are which are ubiquitous uh, on on a lot of systems on chip, um, uh, you have to be careful with them because they don't give independent uniform random coin tosses. Um, Consecutive samples of a ring, of a ring oscillator uh, tend to be uh, tightly coupled because it, it takes some time for the jitter in between the, the two independent clocks to take any effect. Um, similarly, if you have uh, many ring oscillators in parallel uh, and you start them off at the same time, you know, start, start, start them off with the same reset signal or whatever, um, then uh, they're going to be fairly closely coupled, especially also if there's any sort of resonance in the substrate of, of silicon itself. Um, which might you know, it might cause you some trouble. So so even those aren't completely independent. Uh, it's not like you have a, a you know again a, a, um, a fair coin toss each time. And in fact, even honest coin tosses, as um, uh, some research from Stanford a few years ago uh, in Prisadek Bonus's lab uh, turned up, um, even 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 honest coin tosses uh, you make with your fingers, um, where you're not deliberately trying to fix the outcome, uh, even those have have some small biases. Now in contrast, cryptography. Uh, it tends to want uniform distributions. It wants uh, perfect fair coin, coin tosses, or at least something that is uh, not feasibly distinguishable from that. And in, in some cases, uh, even a very small bias like you might have from uh, uh, flipping a coin with your, with your fingers uh, is enough to destroy a crypto system, like in um, uh, DSA or ECDSA per signature secrets. Uh, there are lattice attacks on those which can exploit very small biases to recover what the uh, secret signing key is, which is very bad. Um, fortunately, uh, in modern cryptography, um, we have uh, an abundance of ways to turn a short, uniform, random 256-bit seed into essentially arbitrarily long streams of output that uh, are, as far as anyone can tell, just as uniform. That is, adversaries have no hope of telling them apart from uniform. Um, so 256 bits is enough. Once you have that, uh, then that is uh, that's good enough to do uh, everything you need in cryptography. Uh, as long as the as long as you have 256 bits that the adversary has no idea about, better than uh, fair coin tosses, um, that's good enough for all the cryptography you ever need to do. Um, so there is no uh, modern cryptographic justification for the uh, sort of uh, antiquated idea of entropy depletion, where um, uh, uh, in, 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 in principle, in information theory, uh, the, um, there, there is the, the number of bits of entropy of any, um, uh, of any function of, of a random variable, 
uh, can't exceed the, the number of bits that were in that random variable in the first place. Um, but in practical terms, in cryptography, there's the, the, you, you, don't, you, you only need to release the bits, bits, of, bits of entropy for um, all the cryptography you need. So roughly what an operating system does is um, it hashes uh, uh, enough samples from physical systems together into a short uniformly distributed seed for cryptography, which you get by reading from DevU random. Um, so it takes samples from you know ring oscillators, samples from uh, interrupt timings, takes samples from if you have other fancy devices like a you know you have a USB Geiger counter perhaps, uh, then you can uh, wire that up. Uh, and the operating system will take all these not very uniformly distributed things and uh, hash them together, stir them up in a big pot, and um, uh, spit out a a short secret that that ideally an adversary does not know. Um, but it, it's a little more complicated than that because um, suppose you take a bunch of uh, samples, a sequence of samples, S1, S2, S3. You know, let's, say, let's say it's a, you know, a group of 30 turbing oscillators that you sample every now and then. Um, or maybe it's, maybe it's you know, a, 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 count, a count from a Geiger Muller tube or something. Um, uh, now, each sample um, in, this, uh, in this hypothetical is, um, is from a process with fairly low mid entropy, like 32 bits. Um, so you you know maybe maybe you're 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 getting a a a, a count of, of events over the last second from your um, Geiger counter. Um, now, if you try to use uh, 32 bits on its own uh, immediately, uh, as 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 uh, as all the inputs to a seed for say an HTTPS query. Um, that is small enough that an adversary who sees the HTTPS session uh, can plausibly um, do a brute force search on what the original seed input was. Um, so uh, uh, even if uh, you have a collection of, of, of sam physical samples from a um, from your you know, Geiger, your Geiger counter or something, and maybe the total entropy of all of those samples together is large enough that an adversary has no hope of predicting it. Um, if you expose one sample at a time, then the adversary can, can uh, you're not exposing the sample, but you're exposing just some cryptographic function of that sample, some hash of that sample that involves involves computing, uh, you know, Diffie-Hellman key and publishing the public part and putting that in a TLS session and so on. Uh, the point is the adversary knows what the, what, this, what this procedure is. The adversary just doesn't know the one sample, um, the, the, the initial sample S1. Um, the adversary can then do a brute force search with cost around 2 to 32 computations of, of you know, the, the same Diffie-Hellman key generation process and, and so on um, to figure out what S1 was. And, is, and, and so they, using, using knowledge of the system and knowledge of the output on the wire of this HTTPS query, they can confer, confirm any guess they have, and they just have to go through 2 to 32 guesses or so, to, uh, on average, 2 to 31 guesses. Um, and then if you do another query, um, uh, from uh, you get a new sample, but you do, not do another query, but you've only gotten this new sample S2 on, on top of S1, the adversary can do a brute force search again to recover S2 and repeat and so on. And so the, the point is, if, if you keep trickling out samples um, uh, with insufficient entropy to prevent a brute force search, then the adversary can just keep up with you. And um, at, the, at the end of the day, you actually have no secrets at all from the adversary. Even if you thought you had, a uh, good source of entropy that was just, you know, going slow enough, too slow to keep up with the application. So an, an operating system um, uh, needs to avoid exposing samples piecemeal. It needs to group them into batches with enough aggregate entropy from all the sources that uh, the adversary has no hope of achieving anything with a brute force search. Um, now, uh, in order to, to make sure this happens, you want to gather as much and you know, as many samples from physical processes as you can. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, maybe you want to take a, 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 you know, sample the cycle counter, CPU cycle counter, or some other time counter or something to get a sort of a simulacrum of a ring oscillator uh, in all of your interrupt handlers and uh, take, you know, do, get it, you know, just every, every time something happens, something new happens, uh, look at your watch and enter, enter that into, uh, you know, the, the pool of, of samples to be hashed together. But hashing the samples together Cost some computation. There's some cryptography, and so there's you know, some latency in the computation, and um, so uh, 
So in, in NetBSD, um, we do a couple of things to, to mitigate uh, uh, to, to mitigate that so that the, the, the costs don't become prohibitive. Um, one thing is we uh, gather samples into per CPU pools. Um, so that way, when you want to take a sample, um, you don't have to take a lock. You don't have to take, do any atomic operations that trigger interprocess communication. You can work entirely in um, CPU private memory that uh, is never tainted by some other CPUs um, uh, access. So it's, it's, it's likely to, you know, there's a good chance it's cached. And even if it's not, you don't have to coordinate with another CPU to, to fight over that cache. Um, except early at boot, if we definitely haven't had to risk bits of entropy so far, um, we, uh, 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 do try to, uh, go to some extra effort to make sure, um, uh, that samples get distributed quickly um, uh, early at boot. But aside from that, samples are entered into per CPU pools, no locking overhead whatsoever. Uh, and uh, we put them into, into uh, small buffers um, in, in per CPU buffers before doing any cryptographic computations on them. Uh, it later will turn out computation is computing the catch act permutation just like in, inside SHA-3. But the point is there's some comp you know, cryptographic computation. It costs about 3,000 IV bridge cycles uh, to do a step. Um, and uh, so we put we, we we store samples in a per CPU buffer, um, and during interrupts uh, we never do the cryptographic computation. We just drop any additional samples if the buffer is full. Um, that way we avoid putting uh, introducing uh, latency into um, uh, interrupt handling. Um, that is a minor caveat with that. Uh, right now, some interrupts do block for longer than they should, but that's a, a technical detail for them uh, working out with. Um, uh, some, uh, uh, just some uh, uh, fiddly engineer concerns deep inside that PSD that aren't, aren't that interesting. Um, so I'm going to skip over that. Um, now, another thing is, uh, so you want to gather as many samples as you can, um, but you also, if you have a lot of applications running, they're generating keys, you don't want the applications to have to contend over a single global resource to uh, generate keys. Um, uh, it's 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 really enough. Once you have two disk bits of entropy, uh, then once you have a seed, you can you can efficiently turn that into as many different streams that are as arbitrarily long as long as you need for uh, keys for uh, applications to use. So um, we uh, we draw a dev u random output from uh, a per CPU pseudo random number generator state uh, for scalability. Um, and uh, so, and in order to seed it, we have a global entropy counter uh, that increments every time the entropy subsystem decides, okay, it's time for everything to either get seeded or reseeded for, for whatever reason. It doesn't happen very often. You know, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's rate limited to uh, uh, once a minute, if I recall correctly, you need to double check that. But um, uh, I, um, this enables us to, uh, uh, to lazily reseed uh, PRNGs that are actually in use. Um, uh, if a PRNG is not currently being used, then there's no need to do any computations to, to feed a seed into it to, to start it up. Um, and when we're not reseeding, which is most of the time on systems with with hardware random generator devices, um, then uh, this is totally parallelized uh, and there's um, there's no contention over the, over over any uh, shared resources. So um, <clears throat> there's a problem, of course, which is if you don't have enough entropy, well, you need to make a decision. What do you do? Um, for a lot of modern machines, modern big machines, uh, like x86 machines over the past decade, not all of them, most Intel ones, some low-end Intel CPUs don't have read, 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 seed. A lot of AMD CPUs um, that are more than a couple of years old don't have read, 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 seed, um, and so it's 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 you know this mixed bag. A lot of, you know big servers are pretty much guaranteed to have it these days. Um, in the ARM world, the ARM uh, instruction set uh, had a similar thing to read, 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 seed added to it, um, but I haven't actually witnessed any ARM V8.5 hardware in the real world. Um, so I developed uh, NetBSD's support for the uh, R&D RS instruction in QMU. Um, you know, a lot of newer SOCs have uh, hardware, uh, hardware RNGs, you know, based on ring oscillators. Um, so for, for these machines, that's, this, is, this is not a concern. Um, you know, the, the, you always have enough entropy because you have a hardware device that can provide it, uh, uh, you know, immediately a boot and then it's done and you're good. Um, but not every machine has these. Um, 
And sometimes there are, say, virtual machines that don't have them, and the virtual machine host doesn't have a uh, virtio RND or RNG device uh, set up exposed to the to the guest. So, in some cases, um, you don't have a a, a hardware uh, uh, RNG hardware hardware entropy source at hand. Um, so, well, in NetBSD, um, you can store a seed on disk, like in many other systems, uh, and uh, NetBSD will automatically update it on on boot and shutdown and every day in um, the daily security uh, uh, um, uh, daily security script. Um, so this way, um, even if uh, the file system is compromised, updating it on boot guarantees that uh, unless the adversary can read old versions of the file, which which is you know plausible. Um, uh, in some cases, but uh, if the adversary can't read old versions of a file, then um, the adversary can't go back and find old states that uh, um, dev random was in uh, on prior boots in order to generate, you know, regenerate keys that would allow them you know, to eavesdrop on old TLS sessions or something. Uh, and then on shutdown uh, and daily, uh, NetBSD gathers all the entropy that has been collected into per CPU pools and makes sure that it is. Um, Stored in a batch uh, on the on the disk for the next boot. So, if you have a seed, if you started a, a machine out with a seed, uh, then NetBSD will maintain that across boots. And you know this is this is standard standard practice many OSs. There's some finicky details in in um, uh, how the seed actually gets updated. Uh, I'm not going to go into those details, but uh, it's in the R and D control command in NetBSD to um, uh, make sure it gets updated safely. But what if you don't have a hardware R and G and you don't have a seed on disk? Well, the traditional answer is whenever an application wants to generate a key, you just make it wait. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, this uh, message from GPG uh, that uh, it's a uh, you need to you know bang on the keyboard like a monkey in order to um, uh, get enough entropy. Now, this is partly because GPG this 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 message uh, is, is annoying, partly because. Um, uh, GPG doesn't use a very good algorithm for uh, generating the RSA key. It, it repeatedly asks the, the operating system for more bits when it could just use a um, a uh, uh, APRNG um, in user land. But fine. Uh, this is also uh, pretty annoying on servers where um, you're trying to run, say, generate a key uh, in a script headless, and you don't have an operator to intervene to bang on the keyboard like a monkey. Um, and it actually doesn't even really make that much sense because uh, historically um, there was this premise that the the operating system and the, Linux still does this today and NetBSD up to NetBSD 9 did this many other operating systems do as well uh, would just examine the samples that go into the entropy pools and eh, make up an idea of what the entropy of the underlying process is by examining consecutive differences who literally just compute the difference between two 32-bit samples as, as an integer and um, and maybe look at the difference of the differences and difference of differences and, and uh, if uh, uh, if it came back non-zero, taking enough layers of consecutive differences, um, then it'd say, okay, great, this process must have had some entropy in it. Now, this is this is this this algorithm is designed without any reference to the actual physical device that um, uh, produced the samples. So it's it, it has nothing to do with the, with the physics behind a ring oscillator, nothing to do with the physics behind a Geiger counter. It's it's just um, uh, it's it's and it's in, independent in in Linux and in, in in NetBSD up to nine. It was independent of um, what device it was. it was. This is the algorithm you'd apply to all samples, uh, irrespective of where they came from. Um, but in in NetBSD ten and and also in um, the uh, FIPS these days, this the new standardization. Um, uh, changes in in uh, um, uh, uh, um, FIPS certification. Um, so NetBSD and in, in now FIPS uh, ask that any estimate of the entropy of um, uh, uh, that we count up in the in the in the system to determine whether there's enough entropy that has to be based on how the device actually works. So the driver author, at, at the very least in in NetBSD, the, the rule these days is the driver author should. Um, either have some reference to literature on what the, how the device works, or at the very least have a promise from a vendor that um, uh, this is designed to have a certain amount of entropy uh, in each sample. Um, so there are some drivers in FPSD that you know have 
reference to data sheets about, uh, you know, well, we get a, uh, there are 125 ring oscillators that we sample uh, independently, you know, we, we sample in parallel, um, and we can get a certain number of samples here, and yada, yada. Um, but at the very least, we, we uh, uh, drivers that uh, are for devices that are not designed to be unpredictable do not contribute to uh, a system's uh, account of how much, whether you have enough entropy or not. So, uh, the, of course, the trouble with this, uh, in, a, in practical terms, is that you can't guarantee non-zero entropy uh, and thus stop blocking uh, if you don't have a hardware random origin generator. That is, you don't have a device that was designed um, uh, with, to be a plausibly, confidently have non-zero entropy. For example, on, on certain IP systems, I was talking with one of the developers, uh, it turns out that the timer interrupt and the CPU cycle counter uh, are, have exactly the same clock. Um, so there's no jitter between them. If you tried to use a periodic timer interrupt to gather new entropy, uh, as is you know uh, it's something that that uh, uh, various um, uh, embedded systems would try to do, uh, you wouldn't actually win anything against an adversary who knows that that is how your system works, because the adversary knows what the software is, and they could run the same software, and it will have the the same uh, the same relation between the CPU cycle counter and the timer interrupts. Um, now, maybe there's some other sorts of entropy in, you know, uh, something about the latency of RAM accesses or something like that. Um, but then that's not the, uh, that's not the timer entropy. Uh, that's, that's RAM, that's, that's from the RAM instead. Um, and, uh, so it's, it, 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 it's hard to, to give a confident assessment that you, that you, um, that you have, uh, um, that you have non-zero entropy in a system like this where you don't have a hardware number generator, you don't have a seed on disk, uh, and you just have, um, you know, uh, say periodic timer interrupts, um, which again, historically, this is often often used to make up, you know, it makes you hard to run another generator, but uh, in some designs, it might actually be doing nothing whatsoever for uh, unpredictability. Um, and then, the, the, of course, if you if you can't guarantee this, um, well, so um, if you if you uh, if uh, if you require that the the key generation block until you have enough entropy, then a network appliance, like, you know, a Raspberry Pi, you just, you just plug into the network, um, your private network, or not on the internet, but you're just private network with your, with your laptop. Uh, this appliance might seem like a brick if SSH key gen just blocks until it has entropy, which it doesn't because there's no hardware in our generator. Well, in the case of Raspberry Pi, like most of them do have onboard uh, RNGs, but uh, on a, for a device that doesn't, uh, this presents a very serious usability issue. Um, so one and one approach is to just say, well, that's a bad usability issue. So we should um, fabricate estimates of what the entropy is based on interrupt timings, and it's yeah, it might be good enough. It's probably good enough, right? That's that's even if we don't actually have any grounding in uh, uh, confidently um, making things unpredictable, that is actually what Linux does these days, and what NetSys did for a long time. Many other systems do as well. Um, but it's also kind of lying to you because it's saying, well, yeah, we don't know how this, you know, we don't know, know that this has any, any way to actually be unpredictable in the face of an adversary. We're just going to pretend it is because that's more convenient that way. It's more, it's more usable that way. And there is a good usability argument for this, but, but it's also, it's also kind of dishonest. Um, and yeah, so uh, last year in NetPSD, we uh, experimented experiment mm -hmm. with introducing the get random system call from Linux, um, uh, which is slightly different from reading from dev random. And I'm not really going to go into the details, but uh, it, it blocks sometimes and it, it, and it doesn't block other times. Um, and the experience has been actually uh, uh, fairly negative um, because what happens is that applications, when they need to generate a key, um, it's deep in the b belly of a bunch of logic that is about to do something that isn't really directly connected to a human using a system. So what happens is that, you know, it's in the middle of a build process, in the middle of a Python process that is just trying to import the multiprocessing module and the whole build process hangs. And that's it. That's the feedback that you get. This, oh, the build is stuck, which is not actually relevant. It's not even doing anything on the internet. Um, the reason the multiprocessing module hangs is that it imports uh, a um, uh, uh, imports a random module for no. It, 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 the reason the multiprocessing module hangs is that it, it generates a key that you it might use if you were to try to use it over the internet, but it doesn't necessarily use it over the internet. Um, so sometimes there are workarounds, like in Python, when you import the random module, 
um, there's a workaround where Python just um, it, it, uh, 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 it, it specifically asks for a never blocks path, but that never blocks path isn't available except in uh, internal into Python. So it, the um, uh, uh, when you import the multiprocessing module, it has the Python has no no option for for uh, uh, asking it not to block in this case, um, and really what it's not very helpful for a big you know stack of different things in a in a build process that's you know mostly automated and is you know nested you know components that the operator is not really paying attention to it's not really it's not part of what they're doing it's not helpful for that that to just hang um so instead we uh we we um in netpsd we still use the um uh, estimates of the entropy of the processes of device drivers that, are, that, that you know go into the entry pool, but um, we try to use them for uh, notifying an operator of a potential security problem in other ways. Um, so first, we we offer the option, or actually, this is uh, is currently under, under development, to being changed at the moment. But it, uh, it, we will offer the option for um, uh, the operator to furnish a seed when installing if there's no hardware on our generator, uh, and if the um, if there isn't enough entropy, then in the daily security report, which goes out to the operator by email, um, which, you know, again, network appliances may not be may not have email set up, but, you know, th this is this is a, a mechanism that we have for, for alerting operator security problems. Um, one of them is that if the system doesn't have enough entropy, then uh, we, we will alert them. Um, there's, uh, we might put a one-liner in the MOTD with a reference to the entry man page if it's a security problem. But we also need to be careful to avoid warning fatigue because... Um, you know, with like certificate click-throughs, uh, it just gets to be with like um, certificate click-throughs in uh, um, uh, uh, self-signed certificates. That's not actually security. It's not a security problem worse than HTTP, but people got trained to ignore warnings because it was such a pain to go through those. So we need to be careful to avoid warning fatigue. Yeah. And um, uh, this is still under discussion, but we might remove what I consider to be uh, the failed Git random experiment, which is currently in head so far, and instead switch to um, the never blocking, much simpler Git entropy from OpenBSD that and it looks like POSIX is, is likely to adopt soon. Um, discussion's ongoing. Yeah, this is not a promise. This is just a you know, uh, thing that we're working on uh, behind the scenes. Um, finally, I, I just want to go over briefly some of the cryptographic choices I made. Um, so for the entropy pools, uh, which I um, I guess I, uh, I didn't put the diagram at the end of this, did I? Okay. Uh, so for, anyway, for the entry pools, um, uh, which gather samples from uh, uh, physical systems, uh, we use an algorithm based on Ketchak um, uh, related to SHA-3, um, which uh, uh, lets you feed in a sample and uh, fetch a string uh, that... Um, uh, 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 is is has roughly as much entropy as the original string the original original sample did, but is looks uniformly distributed. Um, this this algorithm is convenient because uh, it it doesn't have any entropy loss in the sense that uh, you can always, if you had all of the inputs and outputs except one, you could recover that one. So that means that we're never losing any information in, in a certain sense. When we do lose lose information if you discard the original samples, if you discard the the outputs, um, but the the crypto doesn't doesn't do that itself. Um, uh, so you know, I, the device drivers obviously will try to discard their samples as soon as they've entered into the pool. Um, but uh, in principle, we're, we're not we don't have to worry about uh, um, uh, uh, entropy of the outputs being substantially less than the entropy of the inputs. And the security uh, uh, is closer to the security of SHA-3 in the, the references in, uh, in the footnote here. For the uh, for generating the output of DevU random, uh, we use the NIST SP890A uh, hash DRG, DRBG with SHA-256. Um, DRBG is NIST's funny term for uh, pseudo random number generator. It stands for deterministic random bit generator because NIST had to be special uh, in their terminology. Um, I, I picked this a couple of years ago because of the SB190A constructions, it was the simplest, uh, it had it admitted the simplest security story um, and uh, it would not uh, invite timing side channel attacks the way that um, say AES counter DRBG does. Uh, we used to use counter DRBG with, with AES until uh, some timing attacks got published that were exhibited on NetBSD in particular. Um, 
That said, uh, I also rewrote NetBSD's AES code in the kernel uh, last year and uh, to eliminate all the timing attacks on all platforms at some cost in performance on some of them. So we could go back to kind of DRBG, but it's, it's not really a big deal because mostly um, scalability is more important than uh, raw bandwidth, raw throughput um, for uh, queries because mostly applications just need to generate 32 bytes at a time from dev view random. And then they can use that to see to open SSL's PRNG or, or, or whatnot. Um, now, why do we use both the Ketchak duplex and the hash DRBG? Um, the idea was that this would make it easier to approach FIPSI certification-y stuff, which I haven't actually done, but uh, in general, nobody ever got fired for choosing U.S. federal government crypto, at least not in the Western world. Maybe in, in, in Russia, people would get fired for doing that. But um, uh, And uh, FIPS at least used to be, although the, the standards are evolving right now, um, uh, less picky about condition components like the entropy pool than about the DRBG that actually generates the output that applications see. Um, so it didn't matter as much, you know, if we use a kind of, kind of unusual but convenient bespoke um, uh, algorithm for the entropy pool and then a very standard uh, NISTy FIPSI thing for the uh, actual output of DevU random. Uh, and it, various other systems use uh, the same uh, DRVG or a similar, you know, another in this SB800 DRVG for, for a DevU random output and get random output and get entropy output. And um, that's uh, that's about it. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm going to go back to the diagram, uh, the beautiful diagram of uh, how uh, the, the system is, is organized. I hope I'm still here. Am I still here? Uh oh. <laughs> Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, um, so there's one question from chat um, uh, from Nia. Uh, two questions. Uh, uh, the first question is, where can I get a USB Geiger counter with documentation so uh, I can write an FG device driver? Unfortunately, I don't actually know where to get a USB Geiger counter, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, if you find one, please let me know because I'm curious. Um, uh, I, I also uh, must admit I have never used a Geiger counter myself as a, uh, a hardware runner or generator. Um, it's uh, maybe someday, but... Um, uh, but yes, they're kind of finicky because it's it's tricky. You know, you need to you need to actually get the you know you you need to worry about the dead time to in order to estimate the entropy of the of the samples, and then you have this alpha emitter, and you got to get handle handle that carefully. Like you could use a sample of polonium two ten, but you maybe don't want to have a sample of polonium two ten around. Also, it's kind of hard to procure, and you know anyway. Um, uh, next, the second question. Um, are there reasons other than FIPS that drove me to pick a Ketchak based construction instead of, say, Fortuna, which is another function specifically done for um, uh, random generators used in FreeBSD and Windows? Um, so, Fortuna um, is uh, uh, Fortuna is another system for um, uh, 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 trying to avoid iterative guessing attacks um, in a certain sense by um, uh, um, using a, 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 an array of different entry pools that are queried at um, uh, um, uh, sorry, that, 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 are, that are, are are combined at different times within into the um, uh, main output. Um, I studied the design for a while, and I I I, I had trouble um, ascertaining what security actually provides over uh, simpler systems that don't involve um, uh, th this, this funny schedule of uh, different PRNGs. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to review the design again. It's been a while since I looked at it. Um, also, Fortuna does not, if I recall correctly, specify a particular crypto primitive. Um, so it is more comparable to the uh, set of per CPU pools um, than to the specific choice of, of Ketchak based primitive. Um, so uh, Fortuna uh, doesn't avoid uh, contention over the pools. Um, I specifically wanted to have, uh, uh, um, uh, I wanted to make, the, make entering and extracting entropy scalable. We had, we've had problems in the past with um, taking samples in network drivers. Um, 
that uh, in order to get a high throughput through network drivers, we had to just turn off the sampling because it was just way too much overhead. Um, and uh, that was when there was a, there, there, you know, we take have to get global lock in order to um, uh, enter the sample, which is real bad if you're trying to do multi-queue network traffic uh, on you know, spread across multiple CPUs. Uh, all of it gets serialized by taking the, these entropy samples. And, and a similar thing would happen with Fortuna because um, uh, the schedule is determined by um, uh, uh, where the um, interrupt, uh, sorry, where, where um, uh, the schedule isn't determined by by the, by by which CPU the, the sample came in on, but determined by something else. Um, um, I think that most uh, Fortuna implementations in FreeBSD and macOS, I think that those just use a, a fairly vanilla hash function like SHA-256 or something. I, I fr I'm I'm not sure about that. I have to double check, but uh, that doesn't have the nice property of pres of, of guaranteeing um, entropy preservation the way the Ketchak construction, the Ketchak duplex construction does. Uh, next question, um, a comment. I'd imagine that a device with an avalanche diode is easier to build an Geiger counter. Yes, uh, most likely it is. Uh, yes, that's another an, an, another uh, fairly common design that I didn't mention along with ring oscillators. Um, I feel like on SOCs, uh, I, I've almost always seen ring oscillators, but yeah, you could use an you could you, you could use an avalanche diode. Um, that's they're fairly well understood. There's literature on them, uh, and you know, easy to easy to work with. You don't have to, you know. Procure a sample of polonium um, which is which is a, a, a bonus. Um, uh, next question: Are there any special considerations in practice when setting up NetBSD VMs? Um, yes, it is a good idea to set up the host so that it provides a Vertio RNG device. Um, if you do that, and if the host is uh, uh, the host has its own uh, uh, its own good entry pool, uh, then the guest will be just as good as the host is. Um, if you don't have Vertio RNG, then uh, the next uh, next best thing would be to uh, put a seed, uh, generate, you know, draw a seed from either the hosts or or something else uh, to store on the um, uh, on the guest file system. <clears throat> of course, it has to be independent for every every guest that you create. So you don't want to create an image and then replicate it across many different machines um, because then they, then they they will have each other's secrets. Um, Unfortunately, not all VMs provide uh, um, uh, an entropy source uh, that I know of. Um, so if you know how to do that with, say, um, I seem to recall Amazon EC2 does not make it easy to get at an entropy source on their ARM, uh, um, uh, in, in their ARM guests. So if you know how to do that, um, let me know, and I'd be happy to put it in the entropy men page in NetBSD, uh, which, by the way, you can read at um, I'm putting, it, putting a link in the uh, chat. Um, this is the uh, current uh, entry event page uh, focused mostly on users rather than on uh, the design. Um, and the design is, is summarized briefly in the um, uh, somewhat weedier rnd.4 man page. Uh, next question. Uh, NetBSD is overdue. Is Entropy still blocking its release? Well, yes, unfortunately, uh, it still have, you know, uh, this ex get run experiment and it's blocking everything and builds are blocked because of it. And, and yeah, uh, no, um, <laughs> Entropy is not actually what's the, the, the only thing that's blocking the NetBSD 10 release. We're also working on other things like, uh, updating DRM graphics, uh, and, um, uh, lots of other things as well. All right. Um, so, do we uh, uh, have any more questions? Anyone like to ask? Anyone? Um, I don't even. I don't even know who's here. I. I, I guess I, there's a list of people uh, logged into this thing. Uh, interesting. Wow, that's a lot of people. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna talk into a void here. <laughs> don't really know what I'm doing. All right, so I think uh, I think my time is is almost up. There's uh, the time for my talk and to end for questions is is just about up. Um, yeah, but... and um, I think actually the the room restarts at something like uh, eighteen twenty five for for recording reasons. Ah, okay. <laughs> so so uh, we're almost done. But uh, thank you. Uh, I, will, I would like to thank you on behalf of the uh, program committee and the. Uh, um, 
uh, organizing committee uh, for a very, very uh, uh, interesting talk. And uh, I think we'll probably be moving on to the, um, the closing session in, well, just a few minutes. So thank you very much, Taylor, for a very interesting talk. Okay. Well, thank you. And feel free to send me an email if you have any further questions. Um, be happy to uh, talk about entropy in another medium. So uh, stay healthy, folks. <laughs>